Okay, in this chapter, uh, we will talk about uh, water, electrolyte, and the acid-base balance. This is one of the uh, shorter chapters of the course, so it shouldn't take that long uh, to go over these, uh, this lecture. All right, when we talk about balance for water and electrolytes, we're talking about the equal amount of, of each entering and leaving the body. So the same amount going in versus the same amount going out. And the body has several uh, mechanisms that it uses to help maintain this balance. And what results is uh, your body being uh, stable at all times, which is what your body wants. And both uh, water and electrolyte balance are interdependent. What that means is if you affect one, you automatically affect the other. They're not exclusive. So if you increase the amount of water in your body, you're going to impact the amount of electrolytes in your body and vice versa. They are interdependent. All right, next, we'll talk about the uh, distribution of the body fluids. Uh, the fluids in your body are not uniformly distributed. There are varying levels of fluid in different locations of the body. Uh, they occupy uh, various uh, compartments of different volumes. And water and electrolyte movement between these compartments has to be regulated fairly tightly to stabilize you know, the distribution. Okay, uh, Within the body, you will have roughly uh, 40 liters of water. Know, water and its uh, know, dissolved electrolytes, and they're found uh, spread out between two major compartments. Uh, the fluid inside the cells, which is the intracellular compartment, and this is about 63% of all body fluids. And there's a fluid in the cells. So the other compartment would be the fluid outside of the cells. That's called the extracellular compartment. And this is the other 37% of body fluids. And here are some examples of what extra, extracellular a fluid may be uh, interstitial fluid, or the fluid in between uh, tissues, uh, blood plasma, because remember that's not within a cell, that's outside of cells, uh, lymph, and transcellular fluid. And this uh, category includes things like uh, cerebrospinal fluid in the central nervous system, uh, synovial joint fluid found with certain joints like the knees and the shoulders and so on. And here's a graphic with all that information you know, put on one. Fluid within the cells, intracellular fluid, about 63%. The interstitial fluid, uh, plasma, lymph, and transcellular fluid make up the remaining 37. So they are not equally distributed at all. All right, next we'll talk about uh, water balance. And this is when the amount of water that's taken in equals the amount of water uh, going out. So intake equals output. And homeostasis is what will require control of both of these. You don't want to take in too much water or you don't want to lose too much water. This has to be as close to a balance as possible. And this will rely pretty heavily on uh, the kidney's ability to vary water output. Sometimes you need to uh, pee out a lot more. Sometimes you need to res retain that fluid and not pee out much. So the main organ involved with all this uh, chapter we'll talk about are the kidneys because they will control water balance. Uh, a water intake. Uh, the volume of water that each person takes in, well, of course, will vary by person and by activity, but it's roughly about two and a half liters or 2,500 milliliters for an adult. And where you get that fluid is from, of course, drinking, you no know, drinks, no other than water, that's about 60%. 30% uh, is from uh, moist foods, you know, like fruits, for example. And the last 10% is what's called the water of metabolism. Water is a very common product of metabolic reactions. So any water compound, any H2O compound that's made as a result of a chemical reaction is called the water of metabolism. And of course the prime uh, regulator of water intake is thirst. So you're thirsty and you drink water. That's the primary regulator of taking in water. Now water output. Uh, various methods to lose water. Of course the biggest one would be you know, losing it in urine. It's about 60% there. Uh, there is some water lost in feces, it's about 6%. Uh, sweat, about 6% also. And evaporation from the skin and in the lungs as you exhale, that's about 28% there. And for here, uh, the primary regulators of water output are the uh, collecting ducts and the distal convoluted tubules of the kidneys, because those are both under uh, hormonal control. As a uh, graphic with both you know, intake of water and output of water on average, you know, water from beverages about one and a half liters, 
750 milliliters for uh, moist food, water metabolism, and so on. Uh, roughly 2,500 milliliters for intake. Same thing for output. Urine, uh, evaporation, and exhaling through lungs, uh, feces, and of course sweat. All right, next we'll talk about electrolytes. Now there are many electrolytes that are important for cellular functions, but we'll talk about the three big ones, uh, sodium, potassium, and calcium. And here are their uh, chemical abbreviations. Na is the chemical symbol for sodium. Of course, that plus indicates it has the charge, that's why it's an ion. The potassium is K, and the calcium is Ca. So there are many, many more than these three, but these three are the ones we'll talk about for our class. And when it comes to electrolytes, the uh, primary regulator for intake of electrolytes are hunger and thirst. All right. Of course, the body will lose electrolytes when you uh, sweat. Of course, when it's hotter out and more humid, you will sweat more, so you're going to lose more electrolytes. And some are also lost in the feces. But of course, the greatest output of electrolytes would be urine output and kidney function. All right, next we'll talk about uh, acid and base balance. Uh, the first two points here are the formal definitions for each one. Uh, for acids, these are electrolytes that will fully ionize or fully split apart in water and release hydrogen ions, and we're represented by H+. And for bases, these are uh, substances that will combine with hydrogen ions. And the, the biggest ion that we need to focus on here is hydrogen ion. That's what will control uh, the pH of uh, body fluids. Of course, the whole whole key is here is to regulate hydrogen ions. Okay, even uh, very very slight changes in hydrogen ion concentration can have huge impacts on the body. It can have impact uh, the rates of uh, metabolic reactions, uh, di distribution of other ions in the body, and even impact hormone actions. So the concentration of hydrogen ion needs to be kept really, really controlled and really, really regulated. And this is, of course, uh, kept track by the pH scale. Hopefully that's something that's not unfamiliar, unfamiliar with you. And the pH scale is a scale from 0 to 14. Uh, 7, which is you know, completely neutral, you know, dead center. The lower numbers, 0 to 6, are acidic. And higher numbers, 8 to 14, are alkaline or basic. These two terms are interchangeable. So the more acidic the solution, the lower the pH number is. So something with a pH of, say, 1 is a very, very strong acid. And the opposite of that is true. Uh, the more alkaline or the more basic the solution, the higher the pH. So a strong acid would have a pH of around 1. A strong base would have a pH of around 14. Okay, here are the uh, basic strengths and acids, uh, strengths of acids and bases. Uh, acids, uh, the stronger ones will ionize more completely and release more hydrogen ions. And for bases, uh, the stronger bases will ionize more completely and release more hydroxide ions. So OH minus or OH negative here as hydroxide ions. So the key thing on this slide, acids will release hydrogen ions here and bases release hydroxide ions. That's a big difference here. All right, talk about the regulation of uh, hydrogen ions uh, concentration. And like I said, even a small shift and either a higher pH or lower pH can have a tremendous impact on the body. So most metabolic reactions will end up producing more hydrogen ion concentrations or much more hydrogen ions. And so the body has various mechanisms to help regulate and to get rid of you know, these hydrogen ions. And we won't talk about these in any real detail, but I did want, want to make you aware of what they are. Uh, one is the buffer system. Uh, the second is the respiratory excretion of carbon dioxide. And the third one is the renal excretion of hydrogen ions. All three of these are used to control the concentration of hydrogen ions. So your body fluids don't get too acidic. Uh, first one, the chemical buffer system. Uh, all chemical buffer systems uh, are found within all fluids and focus on stabilizing the pH of that solution. And the whole point is to make a strong acid a weak acid or make a strong base a weak base. And there are three types of these buffer systems. 
uh, bicarbonate, uh, phosphate, and the protein buffer systems. And bicarbonate is one that we've already talked about when we talked about the digestive system. The bar uh, bicarbonate ion that's released uh, into the small intestine is there to help neutralize the strong acid uh, of the chyme coming into the small intestine from the stomach. So that strong acid of the chyme has to be neutralized, otherwise it's going to destroy that small intestine. So the bicarbonate will be a very high pH to help neutralize that. So it's turning a very strong acid into a weak acid. So your intestines can tolerate that chyme. So was the first one we've already talked about and how the system works. All right here has a uh, some uh, generic uh, information on all three of these. We won't go into any more of this other than you should be able to identify which of these are buffer systems, which ones are not. So bicarbonate system, you know, we'll talk about uh, bicarbonate ion, which we talked about in previous chapters. We'll talk about this one here next, our carbonic acid, and of course the phosphate system and the protein system. All three of these are uh, methods that your body uses to help control uh, hydrogen ion concentration so the body fluids don't get too acidic. All right, next we'll talk about the uh, respiratory excretion of carbon dioxide. Uh, the respiratory center in uh, the brainstem will help regulate uh, the concentration of hydrogen ions by controlling the rate and the depth of breathing. And here's how this works. As you uh, create carbon dioxide, as you breathe that out, carbon dioxide will combine with water in your cells and that combination will form what's called carbonic acid. When this acid breaks up, it releases hydrogen ions. So this, as this builds up more and more, you'll get more hydrogen ions. So that means the pH is going to go down. And like we mentioned before, you can't have too much of a swing in either direction of pH. So this has to be regulated. So the breathing rate and the breathing depth will increase to get rid of that carbon dioxide faster. So if that's not around, it can't combine with water to form carbonic acid. There's a nice little flow chart that's from the textbook. You know, cells increase production of carbon dioxide. That carbon dioxide mixes with water that's already in your cells to produce uh, carbonic acid. That's what H2CO3 is. When that breaks up, it will release hydrogen ion concentration or hydrogen ions. The respiratory center and the brainstem will get, will get turned on. And then the breathing rate and depth will be increased, and carbon dioxide is eliminated faster. All right, next we'll talk about the uh, renal excretion of hydrogen ions. Uh, the nephrons, which we talked about in the previous chapter, help to regulate the hydrogen ion concentration by excreting those ions into the urine so they can be peed out. And the tubular secretion of these ions is also linked to the tubular reabsorption of bicarbonate ions. One will impact the other. All right, I'll talk about the acid-base imbalances. Uh, all these buffer systems we talked about are used to keep a very narrow range of pH. The no normal range of uh, pH in the blood is between 7.35 and 7.45, and that's all. If the pH gets below 7.35, that's when you're uh, creating a condition called acidosis because the blood is becoming more acidic. If the blood pH gets above 7.45, you're creating a, a situation where you're you have more of an alkaline uh, condition for the blood, so you're creating alkalosis. So acidosis, when it, become more, uh, when it becomes more acidic, and then alkalosis, when it's becoming more alkaline and more basic. Okay. And here is the normal range of what the blood pH should be, 7.35 to 7.45. Anything lower than that, acidosis. Anything higher than that, alkalosis. And in general, anything lower than 6.8, or higher than 8.0, you're probably not going to live. That's a you're getting into major, major changes in body chemistry and body metabolism. So odds are not high that you're going to be around fairly long if your pH gets that high or that low. All right, uh, acidosis. This will be created when there's a buildup of acids or if there's a loss of a lot of bases. If you lose a lot of bases, by comparison, there's going to be more acids in your blood, so you're going to have a more acidic of an environment. 
And there are a couple forms of acidosis, but the one we'll talk about here is respiratory acidosis. This is when you get uh, damage to the lungs, such as uh, a tumor or, or injury or any kind of lung disorder or disease like emphysema and so on. And so on. Uh, this damage will lead to a decrease in the breathing rate, which will cause a buildup of CO2. And again, referencing back to a couple slides earlier, that buildup of CO2 combines with water, forming carbonic acid, which when it breaks up, hydrogen ion is released, making it more acidic. Of course, the opposite of that would be alkalosis. This is formed when you have a buildup of bases or also a loss of acids, as like we talked about on the last slide. If you lose a lot of acids, by comparison, the blood will have more uh, bases in the blood. So it will be more of an alkaline uh, condition. Uh, and of course, a key example of alkalosis is hyperventilation. Whenever someone you know, panics or has an anxiety attack or gets scared, they will breathe faster and faster and faster. That's what the term literally means. You know, hyper meaning above. Ventilation, hopefully you recall from the chapter on the respiratory system, the generic moving of air in and out of the lungs. So you are literally moving air in and out too fast. So this hyperventilation will lead to an increased loss of carbon dioxide, which means a lower amount of carbonic acid. So carbonic acid can't be formed, so by comparison, your blood will be more alkaline, more basic. That's why when someone does hyperventilate, they're always encouraged to breathe into a bag. So you are rebreathing that carbon dioxide to increase that amount of uh, carbonic acid. Okay. Of course, that loss of carbonic acid will lead to a loss of hydrogen ions, which will increase the pH. That's why hyperventilation is a alkalosis uh, condition. Again, a flow chart like the one a few slides earlier, anxiety, fever, poisoning, high altitude, you start to breathe faster, hyperventilation, excessive loss of carbon dioxide, which means a lower or a decrease in the concentration of carbonic acid, which means a lower concentration of hydrogen ion, which means respiratory alkalosis. Okay. All right, that brings us to the end of this chapter on acid-base uh, balances in water and electrolytes. Uh, of course, if you have any questions, please ask or post them to the discussion board.